Hello and welcome to a new starting conversation series. I'm Bethany Tabor from the New Mexico Humanities Council, and this new series is Athikia Aki. And this first session is on the topic of placemaking and keeping. We are delighted to co-present the starting conversation series with the Paseo Project in Taos. The Paseo Project's mission is to transform art through community and community through art. In addition to collaborative community projects and a socially engaged artist in residence program, the Paseo Project hosts the annual Paseo Outdoor Art Festival in historic downtown Taos. Since 2014, artists from all over the world have brought projection, installation, and performance art to the streets of Taos for this free two-night event. More information is found at paseoproject.org, which is linked in the description of this video. The history of acequias in New Mexico weaves a rich tapestry of multicultural practices that illustrate human migration, resilience, and connection to the land and water. The wisdom inherent in the historic acequias continue to tell these stories in the communities of New Mexico, but they have been at risk of disappearance in recent years as a result of climate change, increased real estate development, natural resource extraction, and more. Asequia Aki is an artistic and community-driven project that aims to give voice to the historic Asequias of Taos to illuminate the importance of this vital resource and cultural wellspring. For today's discussion on placemaking and keeping, we're joined by four of the project's contributors, Ayrton Chapman, Fritz Hahn, Mark Henderson, and Ruben Olveen. Individually, each of their work intersects either directly with the Asequias in Taos or they have designed interventions and projects that call attention to lost waterways, land care, and cultivation. And to start us off, I'd like to address Fritz Hahn and Mark Henderson. George Fritz Hahn has been a town councilor since 2014 with an emphasis on acequia revitalization, noxious weed mitigation, recycling, landfill operations, and sits on the Hospital Health Study Committee and Nominating Committee. Currently, he serves as a board member of the Taos Valley Asequia Association. Mark Henderson has volunteered doing archeology span since 1965. From 1977 until 2007, he was an archeologist with the US government in Taos, Socorro and Gallup, New Mexico, Window Rock, Arizona and Eli, Nevada. Mark and his spouse Yolanda V. Hill returned to Taos in 2008 where Mark has used his handsome civil service pension to work as a volunteer in archeology, span historic preservation, environmental research, acequia irrigation, and as a docent at SMU in Taos, or under contract through Mark's enterprise, Chupadero Archeology span Resources, LLC. So Mark and Fritz, you both in your contribution to this project, address something right away about the nature of acequias, which is that they are not only a utilitarian technology, but they drive the community. They physically bring people together. And there's a whole community structure that's built around the acequias. So I want to open it up to you, to both of you, to ask you to speak on the history of these communal gatherings. What do, what do the events look like at the beginning of growing season when the acequias are opened? Well, thank you, Bethany. Uh, I, I will, I'll go ahead and get us started, uh, but Mark is uh, truly far more uh, expert than I in this subject, but uh, essentially our in-town acequias define neighborhoods and neighborhoods would get together in the spring. Uh, many of them would conduct a little prayer ceremony uh, and, and then they would get to work. Usually we'd meet at 0700 <laughs> have a lunch together at about noon and finish at about four or five. And we keep going every Saturday uh, until we finish the work. Um, back in the day, um, pre-1969, um, this system was very robust, but with changing demographics, the loss of our young people to larger locales, Phoenix, Albuquerque, Denver, to raise their families, we've lost uh, a lot of, uh, of that very much uh, needed generation. <clears throat> and as a result, uh, oftentimes mayordomos and their commissions on the, their respective dishes must rely on peones or paid participants. A couple of years ago, um, well, six or seven, 
when we had begun to use Mark Henderson and Rachel Prinz's authoritative work on the location of uh, many of our historic ditches here in town, because much of that history was being lost, uh, we were able to reach out to the community and begin to revitalize one of the main ditches off of um, uh, in town, off of the Rio Pueblo. It is affectionately known as Aceque Madre del Rio Pueblo de Taos. Uh, many of us in town uh, volunteered to work on the ditch and, and that early spring morning, we had about 20 folks from the historic district in Taos showing up just to volunteer on uh, cleaning the ditch. In addition to that, we had the mayor, uh, we had the town manager, we even had a newlywed couple. Uh, the cleaning was on a Saturday. I think they had been in Taos for their wedding. They heard about the cleaning, wanted to find out what asakias were all about, you know, they had no idea. And so into the ditch they went with their palas and we had a great time. Uh, we got a lot of work done that day. The following year, uh, we did a, a similar kind of thing, but this time the Taos Valley Aceque Association in collaboration with Sylvia Rodriguez and um, Olivia Romo and an old dean from up north, Ruben. I don't know, I mean to ask you about our family connections there. I think there may be something there, but more on that later. Uh, we had uh, another, uh, our second uh, cleaning and uh, we had a teatro uh, performed by Miss Romo and Mr. Olguin. And then we had a potluck and many people from the community came to uh, share the meal with us as we brought water into Kit Carson Kirk for the second time in maybe 30, 40 years. People couldn't remember uh, how long it had been. Um, and so that's, and now, and now fast forward to COVID, our practice, we can't be quite as robust in our, in our outreach. We have to be COVID conscious. And so instead of putting um, notifications out on Facebook and, and that kind of thing, asking for public support and volunteers, we do it by word of mouth. We keep our group small. We have to socially distance. We can't really eat lunch together. We can't do a potluck together. But the good news is we are adapting to the situation. Um, and, and there's a lot more to be said about adaptation. But to get into the historical content on, on our traditional neighborhoods here in Taos, if I could, Mark, could I turn it over to you for a little bit to talk to us about how the different neighborhoods in Taos were actually created by our Asakia system? Uh, th thanks, Fritz, and uh, you're always very flattering. Uh, I think since uh, since I met you as a town councilman uh, about seven years ago, um, I've never seen a never had the opportunity to work with a politician who so strongly believed in sweat equity and being being a a, a working um, hands on. Uh, demonstrator of for for the public. Um, I'll try I'll try to be brief, um, <laughs> which is always a problem for me. Um, I, I I think that the um, the notion of vecino is embedded. The language of vecino is embedded in the ability in the. Uh, uh, to work together in the Asakia system. And that in, in order to preserve the functionality of the Asakias uh, in an historic context, uh, Fritz already mentioned it right up front, primary issue is how neighborhoods, how neighbors, how vecinos work together to share resources. And if we focus on the Asakia as a physical entity, as an historic structure, um, we lose the notion of the social conditions in which the Asakia operates and the functionality. 
And I think the, the fact of the matter, and I may be drifting a little bit from the, from the direct question, the fact of the matter is we, as, as the community has grown and the number of people who have water rights, uh, surface water rights, which by law and tradition are for irrigation. The number of people has been reduced and the number of people who have no water rights who move into the communities and build structures on formerly irrigated land, that whole um, system of neighbors working together to share a resource, to share an essential resource, starts to flounder. And so that, that's the context we're working in. Um, to directly answer the question of what these events now look like, I think Fritz did a really great job of how they looked like um, up until just after World War II, up until 1969 when the New Mexico Office of State Engineer did a survey of water rights and a hydrographic survey. But now, fast forward from 50 years ago, every acequia is different. And, uh, and there have been always historical differences between the acequias. So Fritz, Fritz's version of what happens on the Acequia Madre del Rio Pueblo de Taos uh, is real different from what happens in other acequias in the Taos Valley. And the, I'll try to leave it here, the, the significance of the Acequia Madre del Rio Pueblo de Taos is phenomenal in the town of Taos because it is by far the primary ditch. So the functioning of the Acequia system as, a as an agricultural and cultural tradition is the Acequia Madre del Rio Pueblo de Taos is central to that. We can't have a revitalized functioning agricultural acequia system if the acequia madre del Rio Pueblo de Taos isn't functioning properly. And the fact of the matter is that the acequia madre, this, this may be too blunt, but the acequia madre has moved from that traditional practice, had already moved before COVID, had moved from that traditional practice to simply hiring peones from the acequia, parciantes dues to the acequia. So the, for 20 years, the parciantes have, the parciantes themselves, much less other neighbors, have not been asked to participate in the annual ditch cleaning, which is fundamental. Over. Thank you both. Um, it's a, it's really interesting to think about like the the way that the community engagement, the sort of landscape of the community engagement has also has been changing along with the landscape of um, of these waterways. Um, so that's something that I would like to get back to um, later on in the conversation. Also, this piece about like the what you brought up, Fritz, um, the adaptation to the environment, adaptation to environmental crisis such as the pandemic. Um, which is very much an environmental crisis. I um, would also love to get back to that as well. Uh, next, I'd like to throw it over to Ruben. Uh, Ruben Olguin is a New Mexico-based artist working in ceramics, adobe, sound, video, and electronic media. His work draws from his mixed Pueblo and Spanish heritage. He uses traditional hand processes for sculpture and incorporates electronic elements. His practice focuses spending as much time in the desert as in the computer lab. His work has exhibited internationally, showing in Germany, Miami, Santa Fe, and Taos. Olguin completed an MFA in studio arts from the University of New Mexico in 2015, and a BA in cinematic arts from the University of New Mexico in 2012. His goals are to make and teach new media art along with socially engaged practices. Ruben, your project uh, with the Paseo project, uh, El Linaje Implicito, Implied Line, 
brings back to life an old acacia that has disappeared, known as the old ditch with film projections. You projected an animated water flow onto the concrete sidewalks and roads in downtown Taos where the old ditch once ran. I'd love to know uh, a little bit more about the process for how you gathered the information, um, how you were able to piece together that route of the old ditch, and also how that echoes your own family heritage of building acequias. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so my family has always maintained an acequia in Bernalillo um, and, and in uh, La Cienega. So I'm very familiar with like the traditions of acequias. And when I got the opportunity to put together a proposal for this project, it just seemed like something that would just come together naturally for me. Um, partly because I know how acequias are built and constructed and, you know, growing up, piggybacking on what Mark was talking about, the um, dissolving of families living within the farm structures and requiring on the labor of families to maintain the ditches was really important. Not just the annual cleaning of the ditches, but the what I call the mid-annual, which is in the middle of summer. After you've ran that ditch a couple times, the plants start to grow really fast in the ditch. And I just remember how often we would have to go out there with the sits and just jump in the middle of the ditch and chop all those weeds and maintain all that sediment and communicating with the neighbors upstream when these things were going to happen. And it was not a second thought to just keep moving up the ditch to help um, clean out your neighbor's ditches as well, because what's happening upstream is also happening downstream as well. So you have to be aware of everybody in the interconnectedness of the ditches and that really resonated with me. And when the ditches are filled in and become something else, that really is a loss to the community and it's a loss to the families that maintained that. And so I wanted to bring awareness to the labor that was put into these ditches and maintaining these ditches for the centuries that they were maintained. And so when I was looking at some of the maps of Taos and I was looking at some of the historical maps, um, trying to find where the main acequia lines were traditionally knowing that these acequias have moved over time. And the rivers themselves that the acequias were branching out of are constantly changing up until the modern era and up until the modern um, way of, of irrigation control has become sort of the standard. Um, these lines moved quite often and the rivers moved quite often. And so you had to be constantly reassessing where the impact of the water was gonna be moving from one season to the next. And so I went and looked at these old maps and tried to find where these old ditches were running because, you know, um, 200 years ago, they didn't have um, uh, uh, the, the sewage systems that we have today, right? Like we're not pumping water from a very far place. So a lot of the town was dependent on the acequias to receive fresh water. Um, and especially downtown areas, almost all downtowns in traditional New Mexico either had a river running near it or had an acequia running by it because that was how the majority of the water was being collected and used and, and uh, all of the, the infrastructures within the town centers were dependent on the water flow. So I was looking for where the old ditch ran. And so I, you have to do this really piecemeal thing. And I got really good at overlaying and developing maps. I used to work in television and I used to have to draw all the maps that you see on television overlaying different kinds of information. So I just went back to this old process of, you know, taking a Google map, taking a modern irrigation map, and then taking these old traditional maps and trying to find the markers and the, the um, specific points of interest that were, that were available and common throughout the maps and sort of aligning them up and figuring out where they're at. And then also knowing that a lot of times what happened when these old ditches got filled in is they usually became roads. So you had a ditch that was taking you along a certain path, they'd fill it in with rubble, you know, um, put sand on top of that and then compress it. Um, very often they just wound up becoming roads. So that was my first inclination was looking at how to draw this line and looking where everything was lining up. And I realized, oh, 
Bent Road is basically where that Asequia was moving down through the downtown area. And so I just followed that line. And sure enough, all of the paths lined up when I overlaid the maps. And you could very clearly see that these walking paths in the downtown area used to be part of the ditch. And where the ditch would bend is sort of where the main entrances of these different areas were. And that goes along with a lot of commonality of how a lot of these ditches were filled in throughout the entire New Mexico and Arizona areas. So it's a very common way for that to happen. And so I wanted to reveal some of those processes. So um, looking at how ditches were laid out on a map, they often use this dashed line or in art, we call that an implied line, right? So if you have a dashed line, we assume that it's a continuous line even though the dashes aren't connected to, together. And so I was taking that from relating to history to now as being this implied line that is continuing even today, as well as the way that the maps were drawn on the lines as well. So I followed some of those lines at critical cross points and I um, recreated in a secchia my studio effectively. And I used a lot of my different film animation, stop motion techniques um, to be able to create this really sort of long video of an secchia. And I basically recreated an secchia in my studio. And then I chopped that up into several pieces and I laid that out in different areas in along where the old ditch was in Taos and uh, um, reprojected those little sections of video back onto the road so that way people could experience and understand that where they're walking now used to be a flowing ditch that was the primary sustenance for the town. Right, It was like this life vein of water that ran through the town and that's all been covered up and there's not really a whole lot of hint of where those lines used to be and why the town is where it is and why the city center is where it is. And all of that comes back down to the acequias and the ditches. And I was trying to sort of echo that and sort of re-display that for people to understand. Thank you for that um, insight into your process. It's. Uh this like collaging of maps is um, sort is endlessly fascinating to me. And it's also fascinating that there's, um, there's this whole, as you talk about um, your family maintaining these, maintaining these acequias and building the acequias, there's a whole human eco ecology that has to be, um, that fits together all of these puzzle pieces that fit together with the people living and maintaining these ditches and, um, and then it gave way, it's, it's sort of, there's a disconnect. It gave way to a new um, like metropolitan city human ecology. Um, the only reason why, I mean, something that the point that your work makes is that the only reason why there is a metropolis in Taos is because of these acequias, um, which have now disappeared. And so what, and so that's like a, the implication of that is pretty, pretty massive. Um, and it's, all of this is the the discussion around like human acequia, human waterway relationship is um, complicated by Ayrton Chapman's work, um, which we will introduce next. Um, and I'll I'll ask you about that, Ayrton. Um, so Ayrton Chapman was born and raised in Kilgore, Texas. She completed her undergraduate degree in photography at the University of North Texas and received her master's in experimental art and technology from UNM in 2017. During her time in grad school, she joined Edible Carnival and has been touring and producing work individually and with the carnival since. You can see more of her work linked in the description of this video. So Ayrton, we've been discussing the importance of acequias and waterways and the community of people surrounding them, but your video piece for Paseo 2019 is uh, rooted in the absence of people and you sort of erase the humans. So can you elaborate on your choice to leave the humans out of your, your video? Yeah, um, thank you, Bethany. And thanks everyone uh, for having this conversation. Uh, it's interesting, I've seen, I've actually experienced the, everybody working on the ditches and cleaning them up, but we moved down to Los Lunas and got some land here and started wanting to do some agricultural stuff. So we're kind of, the opposite of what some of you guys are talking about, people moving in and not wanting to do that agricultural work. So we moved here and, and started doing the agricultural work. And it's very interesting where I'm at, 
basically all of the properties around us are horse properties. No one else really utilizes the Asekia system. And I think that that may be part of the reason that I did not include people. Uh, one, it was just a documentation of our first time. I was very excited about bringing this water in and starting to have living things and e ecosystem where there was just dirt. Um, but the other thing is it's, it's very different for us when it's time to start watering because we're the only people who do any of that. And it's, uh, <laughs> there is no communication with the neighbors. There is no working on the ditch altogether. It's kind of just, if we want the ditch to be clean, we have to go clean it out. Just me and um, my partner that lives here with me. And so it's, <laughs> it is a, it's a different situation. And it's very interesting to see that disconnect. And it's interesting to feel what that does for me personally, because we're the odd people out, we have not, not only, we're not really agriculturally driven, we're not trying to produce a lot of food to sell, but more I'm driven by the idea of allowing plants, the ones I plant and the ones that just exist to exist and create ecosystems for insects and birds and everything, animals, everything that comes along with that. And also just the soil ecology, building that up. Uh, I'm also getting a bit off topic there, but it's what my point here is, our yard is very different than the yards all around us, which is the, you know, people will just t turn their dirt so they can ride their horses. And I think that's, a, you know, to each their own, but I feel I have, you know, do my neighbors all hate me because we have all these weird plants in our yard? You know, uh, there does everyone just want us to leave because we're actually growing things? And I know that's a, a silly thing to think, but then I just remember that there are bees in my yard and there are praying mantises and there are ants and there are birds and all number of different creatures. And for me, creating a diverse ecology that can support things that aren't just people is sort of number one most important to me in a, a land that I have any control over. And so I think that that's probably the reason that I left people out mostly of that video uh, is more to think about how we can work with the land in a way that isn't just a domination. Uh, thanks. It's thanks for that. It's like uh, I see my mind is like turning. Um, it's like recreating the habitat to sort of start all over again, um, and to allow for like the land to, to to like sort of take a step back and allow the land to replenish itself, so that then you can like then you can re-enter, reinsert yourself to then take care of it, maintain it. Um, and I think that uh, it's, yeah, that nuance of, of humans being far too removed and so then, but then they have to take a step back. It's a, that's a complicated, um, a complicated difference. And um, I wonder, I would like to pose this question to you and Ruben, to everybody, um, but especially you two, because it's your work, your piece in the Paseo Festival um, is sort of new media or considered new media. And so I wonder what you all think about the role that contemporary technology plays in um, where we go in this next chapter of Asakia maintenance, revitalization. How do you think technology, um, new technology can serve those revitalization efforts? I'll go ahead and uh, respond. For me, there's a couple of things. One, just the phone technology, we're able to contact our ditch rider and get, you know, get the water when we, you know, it's a, I think that that maybe streamlines that in a way, cause you don't have to go find somebody personally. And then the other thing, something that I strive for in a lot of the different work that I produce is inspiring people to become interested in nature, ecology, agriculture, any part of that, you know, just getting those images, getting those videos out there and getting people engaged in content that is about this world that we live in and how we can be a part of that. So I think that that for me is the strongest point there is 
just getting more people to engage with content about nature. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point, Ayrton. Like being able to get that outreach is really important. To be able, not everybody can visit a farm, right? No, not everybody can come to your place and see sustainable agricultural practices. So we have to find innovative and creative ways of getting that information out to the younger generations. Because I'm sure Mark will attest to this, our farming culture is aging and there's not a lot of young people that are picking up this torch and coming in and rehabilitating the lands that have been left vacant for so long. Um, a lot of these lands are being picked up and purchased for non-agricultural purposes, right? Like horse ranching and things like that. And so being able to get that information out there and to motivate our, the younger generations to get involved in agriculture and to be part of a solution of sustainable living and sustainable practices, I think is really important. And that's one of the things technology can bring because our younger generations, that's their first language is technology, right? Like they, my daughter can speak text better, you know, than, than most adults. So I think it's important, like you have to engage people where they're at and not expect them to always come to you and hopefully inspire and motivate people to that same process and also reveal that technology doesn't have to be in contrast to sustainable living, right? Like they can live and marry together and be used together. And I think technology can bring that through virtualization, bringing people into the farm virtually or, or through these other sort of augmented spaces that we can create, such as some of the work that the Paseo has done in Taos you know, taking those ideas and concepts and imagery and bringing it back out into the public where they can view it more readily. Yeah, I also think about the point that Fritz brought up um, early on about like the COVID adaptation um, and like being COVID conscious and sort of the, um, this idea of being, um, all of this, these like participatory activities around SACM maintenance, um, like being spread by word of mouth. And um, I think about like the efforts that we have made in this remote uh, living that we've had to do for the past year. Um, we are recording this in March, 2021. Um, and all of the uh, outreach that has been sort of developed or the, the digital infrastructure that has been built around trying to work remotely and um, how that has, how that sort of, I don't know, Fritz, if you have any more thoughts on this, um, but how that the digital infrastructure and out, has served your outreach to getting people to participate, even though you have to have smaller gatherings and, and be socially distanced and make all these adaptations, um, sort of the, the uh, new digitally built world has maybe served that outreach getting people involved. Right, Bethany. Um, it's all about education. And so what our communities artists like Ayrton and Ruben bring is that exposure. Bear in mind that the Paseo, uh, the big the big crowds for Paseo, when it does happen, it's all on the streets and there are different installations. It happens at night. It's like the thing to do. And when you look at how Taos is changing, um, with more uh, newcomers coming into town, uh, oftentimes this is their first exposure to the gift that our elders gave us, the gift of our asakias. And that kind of education goes a long way. And when we do then have an outreach effort to, and hopefully when COVID is done, we can get back into this annual routine, uh, inviting newcomers in to learn about it and work with some of our elders and hear the stories and share a little bit of blood, sweat, and tears um, and laughter and full stomach. So it's not all, it's, it's not all brutal. In fact, it's not brutal at all. You don't work in the ditch in a brutal fashion and you work with the land and you work with what you have. and You deal with um, big, big old elms and such. And, uh, but my main thing is our artists are the conveyors of the message to the new folks and can introduce new folks to our elders' ways and our elders' wisdom. So it's very precious. So I'm very grateful to our artists and Ruben and Anton. Um, you, you help us 
our, the interest in Taos has increased uh, dramatically over the last six, seven years. And that's in no small measure due to your efforts, to the Paseo's efforts to get the word out. So artists are the conveyors, the educators. Thank you. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Fritz was saying, I think it, I, at the Paseo, I had so many conversations with people that didn't know what the Asekias were and didn't know how they functioned and why they had to have, you know, why there were open fences near the Asekias for other people to be able to come in and maintain the ditches. And um, this idea of opening up your property to strangers to come and work on your land you know, I think is foreign to a lot of people. And that amount of community um, collaboration is something that I think a lot of people have never experienced before. And they come out here hearing all these stories about how awesome Taos is. And then, you know, being exposed to those kinds of things for the first time gives them a real sense of the community that was here long before they even knew that Taos existed. Bethany, if, if I could make a comment, I, I'd like to jump in. Please do. I, I, th I think what Ruben said about transfer of intellectual property from people who are operating engineers, every Asequiero is an operating engineer. And the, the notion of transferring, sharing that knowledge is inextricably intertwined with sharing the water. And so we have a real opportunity here because of technology that we sh shouldn't lose in our struggle to get back to normal, whatever that is. We have an opportunity over the last year that maybe we haven't utilized as effectively as we could because one, one of the things I've heard is that Asakia commissions are not meeting, annual meetings are not being held. Asakieros are not getting together because they're adapted to the face-to-face -face communication. And maybe instead of waiting to get back to normal to a face-to-face -face situation, we should be doing what many schools in this country are talking about doing and increasingly all institutions are talking about doing is developing hybrid models where people can participate in the sharing of knowledge using the technology um, or they can participate um, in face-to-face -face when conditions are right. And another thing that we can, we we could be doing is using this opportunity since many people feel somewhat confined to their own property is it's an excellent opportunity to where there's a block ditch or where the ditch needs to be cleaned to give find out who your neighbor is because many people don't even know who their neighbors are and ask them if maybe for well-being they could go out on the neighbor's property and clean the ditch and maybe unblock it. So the longer we are in this condition where we're thinking about essential uh, activities, we could be using this as an opportunity with the technology uh, to rebuild, to revitalize our ditch system. Over. Ayrton, I'm kind of curious, how, what kind of reconstruction have you guys had to do on your Asequia and how was it difficult? Have you had to put in new culverts? Have you had to redraw like lost or, or filled lines in certain areas? Well, our ditch is actually concrete. And so it's mostly pulling like things that start growing in it and, and clearing dirt. So we, and cause it's, I don't, I don't know that I could actually re it, it, it it's very sad because it's real it's a really nice ditch but it's just getting basically I mean the elms you know it is just it and and there's 
some elms that it's just like, I can't get that out. I just have to cut it back because it's not, I, there's not, there's no way I could. I mean, I guess there is a way, but it's not, it's beyond my level of, so yeah, we haven't had to do any reconstruction, uh, but it's just, it's mostly just cleaning and, and um, maintaining it in that way. Um, I think this uh, uh, conversation around like the, there seems to be like a push and pull between like having, between having people directly involved um, and then, but then in this time of pandemic where everybody is sort of remote, everybody has to distance, there's like, there's um, and the absence of, of human intervention on the environment. I mean, I think of all those sort of like the kind of internet memes that um, came, were coming out at the beginning of this pandemic where it was like the earth is healing or whatever. Um, and which is sort of jokey, but also like completely true. There's this, uh, the stepping back of, of human interaction resulted in a lot of like re the earth replenishing itself. And I, um, it's just interesting to me, this is an observation, more of an observation than a that that has the the time where we've had to spend in our homes and being um in uh and and being sort of i guess on the internet with each other a lot um we've been doing that kind of like education um sort of what mark and fritz were were talking about and, and you ruben brought this up as well this sort of like the the education and cultural sharing and cultural engagement passing down these stories um, and being able to like really think about and talk about these subjects. Um, and like, what, even though we're not able to be gathered in large groups to maintain um, ideas and to, and to be together to do, we've been able to step back and be together digitally to talk about it, to educate ourselves, um, which is another, that's, that's sort of this absence of human presence that Ayrton's video, um, was was getting at, um, albeit like years before, <laughs> before the global pandemic, before it was all a reality that uh, a reality that we came to inhabit. Um, I think that we're about almost out of time. I try to keep these to about forty five minutes, um, and I think that I would just like to know from you all any sort of wrapping up, any sort of thoughts about how you see. Um, how you see the future and like what we are at a critical point, I think in history um, where a lot of decisions are gonna have to be made. Like we're having to rethink, we're at a point of major human adaptation to the earth. I mean, experienced massive, massive environmental crises. And um, it seems, I feel optimistic and hopeful about people's um, revitalized interest in cultivating the land. Um, and I would just like to know your perspective um, and specifically contextualized within New Mexico, within these, the cultivation of these waterways, what are your sort of views on, on the future of these waterways and the future of um, the new generation coming into land cultivation? Uh, well, I'll go ahead and start and uh, maybe a little bit off point, but uh, what I have to say is tear out your lawn, plant a garden, Learn about permaculture. You can do it. Everybody can do it. It's really fun. It makes you feel incredible to be out there working in the land and hard work is good for you. So those are my final points. Tear out your lawn, <laughs> plant a permaculture garden. You can do it. Yeah, I totally agree with Ariton. And I think uh, doing permaculture is something that is like a buzzword these days, but Really what it is, is going back to establishing land practices that were historically um, preserving the land as well as bettering the life of the humans that interacted with it, but also having consideration for the animals that lived around it. And so bringing back native plants into your yard, feeding the bees with the beautiful native flowers that are out there, so important. We're losing our bees and we need to help sustain the bee and the insect populations, there are more pollinators that are not just bees, and they all require specific plants that have been lost throughout the ecosystems. And it's really important to sort of bring those systems back 
Um, and I think that's the first start, right? That gets people invigorated and enjoying gardening. And then they realize that you can sustain your family with these practices. You can have vegetables, you can have fruit, you can have all of these things that we've come accustomed to relying on grocery stores for just living in your backyard. And all it takes is a little bit of effort to be able to have that. Um, I think it's also important to realize the reality of our situation that global warming is a real thing. And as we start to lose the amount of water that is replenishing our rivers every year, we need to rethink how we're using that water. Um, the traditional way of acequias was not just flooding a field for alfalfa, right? Which has been an extremely um, detrimental impact on the acequia systems, relying on alfalfa and just flood irrigation. And I think a lot of acequias are starting to realize that permaculture provides a better situation for impacting the land and better using the water that is available um, rather than trying to require more water to produce the same thing. So um, I think just looking at sustainable practices is really important and um, creating the outreach for that so that way people understand why. I'll jump in since Fritz hasn't spoken yet, and I'll leave it to him maybe if we're getting to the end of this. Um, the Abeta settlement, one of the, one of the questions you had that we didn't get to is the, the Abeta settlement didn't anticipate sustained mega drought. The Abeta settlement was based on a notion of how the world operates 50 years ago. And it, it evolved over the 40 years of negotiations, but it, it is based on a notion of really, from my, from my reading of it, it's based on a notion of unlimited growth, of no, no limit, no, no immediate limit to how many more people we can bring into the valley and have enough water for their domestic uses. Uh, so we need to we need to be thinking uh, in the future and educating people about water budgets. And we need to get folks to think about their water budget like some some people think about their money budget and that a primary opportunity we have for conservation education of water is for people to realize that when they turn on the tap of their uh, treated water supply, that they're actually withdrawing water from the surface water for agricultural purposes. And that the two things are interrelated and the public needs to understand that. And we need to find ways so that every citizen has a basic understanding of the hydrologic cycle, just like we think every citizen needs to have a basic understanding of how their taxes are used. Over. Well, what great comments. Thank you, Ertan and, and Ruben and Mark. Uh, I'm coming from a place of um, a tipping point with uh, projections indicating a mega drought. Looking back in, in history, going back a thousand years and looking at what may have occurred in, at Mesa Verde and other high dryland areas, Chaco and and other sacred sites, there's no doubt in my mind that we're at a tipping point. And one of the benefits that we have in Taos is that because the town of Taos is a parciante or a participant on two ditches here in town, the Acequia Madre del Rio Pueblo de Taos and the Vigili Romo, every citizen in the town of Taos, that's 5,000 people are now qualified to participate in the maintenance and annual cleaning of the ditch. When we're bringing water down into our historic Kit Carson Park, 
we have a need for volunteers, citizen volunteers to learn how to work that system. It's quite intricate. And it, it's a beautiful system. And we have a similar kind of situation on the Vihili Romo. And that's very exciting for school children, their parents, their grandmas and grandpas. Uh, we have elders who remember when water used to run in the park. They remember when the Vihili Romo used to run. Ditches that were given up for lost just a handful of years ago. Uh, the community was not aware of their degradation and, and had just kind of assumed it was a foregone conclusion that we would lose our Asakia culture, that it just came with modernization. Well, actually what we've discovered is that no, the elders have given us a tool for survival. The elders going back a thousand years and more. And then with Spanish conquest, the, the very first thing is as Spanish folks came into this territory was to establish a line of communication with Cacique at the, our, at the Pueblo and at other Pueblos as well, to work out water sharing agreements and to begin to expand upon the system. That's how our neighborhoods in Taos got established. But we are at that tipping point right now. And it's exciting to note that every citizen in the town of Taos has a right and I might add, an obligation to help with the maintenance of our communally owned ditches. It is the last of the commons with the advent of the Forest Service and, and the fact that we've been a, a cash poor, land rich economy for 150 years has all played havoc. But now we can get back to the gift of our ancestors. So if we can get this water, the surface water uh, going out and then seeping, percolating down into the many aquifers under Taos, those aquifers will hold onto that water and protect us in the long run against mega drought. They will help to nourish our tree canopy to keep Taos cool. Imagine if we had no trees in Taos, it would be hotter than Hades, right? And water would evaporate. We live in a semi-arid desert and we've got to look at the facts which project the mega drought. So, you know, and with all of our concerns environmentally with uh, plastic pollutions, microplastics and, and uh, recycling issues and uh, all kinds of environmental insults, uh, the average citizen may think, well, what can I do? I, I just work at Smith's as a grocer and I make a decent wage, but you know, I'm not on a ditch. Um, we don't farm. Um, I, I do believe in our environmental concerns, but what can I do? Well, here it is. What you can do is get your pull off and bring your, your blood, sweat, and tears into the ditch and, and help us clean. And when we bring down water and put a, out a call for help and need, need uh, water, water guides, if you will, uh, to manage the water, uh, because these all happen in public settings, we need, we need help and you can be involved and you don't have to know anything. We'll teach you from A to Z. And even those of us who think we know a lot, there's not a day when we go out on the ditch and don't learn something new. So it's a great way to stay physically healthy, mentally acute, a great way to uh, uh, help your community. And this fight, <clears throat> if you will, this effort addressing the environmental action required to maintain our ditches is not, is not a gift for you or for me. We've had great lives. It's for our children and our grandchildren. What will be their water sustainability strength in 50 years, as Mark was alluding to with the water budget. So asakias are an integral part. And I, I, I challenge if, if you feel like you just need to do something concrete to help out our environment, please uh, get in touch with me or any Parciante and we can very quickly get you involved. And we have good neighbors like that who don't have water rights, who believe in what we're doing, who do show up to help and to work um, on, on the Asakia. So this really is a, a call to environmental action. 
we can all do something. I realize our environmental challenges are beyond compare, but this is one thing that we can do that will attain water sustainability for our future generations. And that's what this effort is all about. Thanks. Thank you, Fritz. Thanks for opening and closing this session. Um, uh, I think that it was a great, thank you to all of you, Ayrton, Mark, Ruben, um, for offering up your time. It's so generous of you all to offer your insights and uh, let us into the your processes. Um, and it was a really great conversation today. And I think that um, it's really, uh, this was a great call to action, um, a great, great note to end on. And um, in the description of this video, there will be links um, and resources uh, to more information about all of these projects, artistic and environmental uh, calls. Um, and also since most of our audience, um, most of our initial audience that will be tuning in is in Albuquerque, there are lots of acequia associations in different neighborhoods in Albuquerque um, that similarly have a lot of uh, uh, participatory opportunities. So I invite everybody to um, dig into these resources that we are providing you with. Thank you all so much again. And this has been a great session.